Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Jonathan Marsden. I'm the chair of the Metropolitan Transport Forum. We are an independent, non-partisan group of delegates from the 26 Metropolitan Councils. And it's our pleasure to host this forum tonight. We are hosting the forum in conjunction with Mary Beck Council as well. But before I talk any further, I'd like to acknowledge that we, MTF and Mary Beck City Council, acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways in the area now known as Mary Beck and pays respect to their elders, past, present and emerging as well as to all First Nations communities who contribute to the life of the area. The Metropolitan Transport Forum is committed to truth-telling and reconciliation with the First Nations people who have moved and traded across this country for more than 3,000 generations. Thank you for joining us tonight, both in the room and on the live stream. We are joined by a number of Marybeck councillors who I'd like to acknowledge, including the Mayor, Councillor Mark Riley. Thank you for being here tonight. And we have Councillor James Conlon, Councillor Monica Hart, Councillor Sue Bolton, and, and oh, yeah, so, sorry, and, and Angelica as well. I'd like to re recognise other local government representatives here tonight. We are joined by a number of the other candidates for the election for the Northern Metro Region and the seat of Brunswick. And I'd just like to, I'll acknowledge them after I, I before I introduce our, our panel. And they are Jerome Small, who is the Victorian Socialist candidate for Northern Metro Region. There he is. We have Leah Horsfall, who is the Animal Justice Party candidate for the Northern Metro. Rachel Lamarch, who is the Animal Justice Party candidate for Brunswick. <laughs> and I'd like to thank them and all other candidates who have put their names forward in order to participate in this thriving democracy in the city of Brunswick. Before introducing tonight's speakers, I'd like to outline the format and the ground rules for tonight. Firstly, it's a transport forum, and we ask speakers and the audience to focus on transport-related topics. We've got limited time, really. It's an action-packed session and we want to make the most of the time that we have so it's important that we focus on the answers that our candidates will give. This is really a chance to hear from the four candidates on the panel to understand what their priorities and policies are for the upcoming election. We'll start the forum by inviting each panellist to speak for up to six minutes on their perspective on local and metropolitan transport issues. We have a person timing the speakers, who is my colleague and organiser of the entire series of forums, who is very handy with the bell. And he will ring that bell when the speaker has one minute remaining and then two bells when the time is up. So one minute remaining, Greg. And time is up. Wonderful. At about 7pm, we'll start the question and answer part of the evening. And at that time, we'll ask people with a question to raise their hand. I'll invite one person at a time to come um, to, to request the microphone, and I'll direct uh, Craig Griffiths, who's um, an, an officer with Mary Beck Council and a delegate to the Metropolitan Transport Forum, tonight acting as concierge. Um, and I'll ask him to bring you the microphone, and I'll keep a list of those people who would like to speak in order that everyone gets a chance. I'm, I'm going to focus on getting a representation of questions. There has been a number of questions pre-submitted, um, but I'd like to hear from the floor. I, I'd like to hear from more than one gender. I'd like to hear from all age groups, capabilities, and people of different backgrounds in order to tap into the diversity and richness of the community that are here tonight and watching on, on live stream. So again, please limit your remarks and questions to less than one minute, and please ask a question. So it's, it's not a chance for grandstanding or, or speech making from the floor, but rather a chance to ask the candidates what, what they think and what they intend to do once elected into parliament. 
We'll give each panellist up to two minutes to respond, and again, Greg will time them. We thank people in advance for brief and to-the-point responses because that helps us get through more questions, making for a more interesting experience for, for everyone in the audience and on, on the live stream. And then finally, at about 7.45pm, that is quarter to the closing time of 8 o'clock, we'll invite each panellist to make final remarks of up to two minutes long. All of this is being live streamed and recorded and will be available from the MTF website in the next day or so. And now it's time to introduce our panel. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the following four participants in tonight's election forum. First of all, we have the incumbent, the, the current member for Brunswick, Dr. Tim Reid, MLA. Thank you for being here tonight, Tim. We have Evan Mulholland, who is the lead Liberal candidate for the Northern Metro region and a participant, as, as was Tim, in the last election forum. So it's lovely to see you again and thank you for being here. Mike Williams, the Labor candidate for Brunswick. Thank you, Mike. We have Shay Evans, who is the Reason candidate for Brunswick. Welcome, Shay. Unfortunately, the Reason Party MLC, Fiona Patton, who is a strong supporter of the MTF, was to speak tonight but has withdrawn for medical reasons. She, is, she has had successfully a kidney removed today and we wish her all the best in her speedy recovery. She's happy for me to mention that because she's keen to talk about her experience. And so I'm grateful for you standing in, Shay, and I appreciate it. In order to decide the order of the speakers in the panel, we have four playing cards. The ace, the two, the three, and the four of hearts. And um, I'm going to ask now each of the candidates to draw one card to decide the speaking order. Who will be the ace of hearts? This is not a magic trick. <laughs> Can you all hold up your cards, please? It seems that the Ace of Hearts is Dr. Tim Reed, and he, he will go first, followed by number two, Mike Williams, and then Evan Mulholland, number three, and then the four of Hearts is Shay Evans. So I'll invite Tim to come to the microphone now to address us for six minutes. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, and thank you to the MTF for organising this series of talks. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri, the traditional owners, and paying respects to their elders. And also to thank Mary Beck Council for hosting uh, and congratulate Mary Beck Council on the recent name change, uh, which brings to mind what this place must have looked like uh, hundred and something years ago when, when there was a farm here called Moreland and, uh, and what we've done to this place since and, and how important transport has been in shaping our neighbourhood, particularly over the last 70 or 80 years when cars took over as the more dominant mode of transport. Um, I want to just start by taking you to two places in the Northern Hemisphere. Do you remember the town of Lytton? which briefly made headlines in the Rockies last June, I think it was, uh, 2021, for hitting a temperature of 49.9 degrees in an area that gets snow in the Rocky Mountains. It burned to the ground in a big heat wave in, in Canada last year. And then this year, in Lincolnshire in the UK, where the UK got over 40 degrees for the first time. I don't think I need to tell this audience that we have a climate crisis. And, but what a, a really important point to make is that emissions, carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions from the transport sector in Australia, in Victoria, are rising. And in every other sector, they're falling or steady. But particularly in energy and land use, emissions are falling but rising, mainly because of cars. 
and Australians buy a million cars a year. Almost all of them petrol and diesel cars. And if you do the maths, that's almost a thousand new cars purchased every working day in Victoria. Tomorrow, Victorians will buy a thousand cars. So do we want them to be burning petrol for the next 10 to 20 years, however long those cars last? I don't think so. If we've got a climate emergency now, we need to move people from cars to other modes of transport as fast as possible. And the remaining cars should be something other than petrol and diesel. They should be electric. And we need to do that too as fast as possible. We need both. We're not going to get rid of cars entirely or quickly. So we need to do both of those things. And recently I met a couple just a very short distance north of here, living in a house with a driveway. So from about here south, there are no driveways because the, the houses are 120 years old and there were, people just had horses and bikes. From about here north, you start to see driveways. And they were just a little bit north of here, and this couple had a driveway and they had four cars because the four family members, the, the couple and their uni-going two children, one to, going to VU, one going to La Trobe, and the, the two parents with jobs in different places all had to drive to different places. And I politely and diplomatically inquired about the possibilities of public transport, but really it wasn't working for them. They'd all tried it, and the frequency just wasn't there. You know, you have to wait for a train, and if the train, something happened to that train, it, would, it might be 40 minutes between trains, and the connection with the bus was wrong, unless you were going to the CBD or somewhere that was well served by public transport, the network just wasn't working. And so the problem, the biggest problem we have with our existing public transport network is frequency. And those of us who live in this area know that all too well because the upfield only manages three trains an hour, when many of Melbourne's other lines will run six or more trains an hour. And there are all sorts of complicated reasons for that, but we can and we must do better if we want to get that couple down from four cars to something more realistic for living here. Likewise, buses, some of Brunswick's bus routes don't run on a Sunday. And some of them are extremely infrequent after about this time in the evening. And you're often looking at 20 minutes between buses for various routes. In Parkville Gardens, which has been part of the Brunswick electorate and will be until the end of this month. Um, so what's that, five or? One minute to go, okay. In Parkville Gardens, buses were only running once per hour, but I've worked very hard and finally we've managed to get the government to agree to running nine or ten extra services a day in Parkville Gardens. Other priorities for me are to make the tram stops on Sydney Road accessible and elsewhere in Melbourne, and to introduce safe bike lanes and make walking safer so that active transport is more of an option for people. And finally, we've got a city that's built for cars, not for people. And we need to switch those priorities so that the place is more livable, emissions go down, we have less congestion, and it's safer to ride your bike or to walk or to even cross the road. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. The next speaker is Mike Williams, who is the Labor candidate for Brunswick, and I invite you to speak to us for six minutes. Thank you, Mike. Well, thanks very much, Jonathan, and thanks to the um, MTF and Marybeck City Council. Um, I acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight, and I uh, pay my deepest respects to their elders past and present, and I extend that respect to other First Nations uh, people who may be present tonight. Um, I acknowledge uh, the councillors and other elected people in the, in the audience um, and on a, a fairly uh, all-male panel I acknowledge Leah and Rachel um, who are here tonight as well and I wish Fiona um, all the very best in, in her recovery. Well welcome everyone to this, uh, this terrific event. Um, I'm so proud to be standing here as the Labor candidate for Brunswick. 
Um, I live in Brunswick with my East Brunswick with my partner, uh, right near the number one and number six tram lines and, and close to the number 96 tram line. Um, I also cycle um, and I also uh, walk around this great suburb um, and area of ours. I'm running um, in Brunswick um, for Labor to be part of the most progressive government in our history. It's a government that's taken real and substantial action in combating climate change with the biggest transition to clean energy anywhere in Australia and the most ambitious storage targets in the world. The result of all of this is that we're on track to halve our emissions in Victoria by 50% in 2030. I'm also running to get things lo done locally in Brunswick. The job of a local member is to deliver things locally and to have a record of achievement at the end of their term, and I want my community to hold me account for the commitments that I make. Labor's not wasted a minute in doing what matters in public transport and delivering with record amounts public and accessible transport infrastructure. Our city is growing, Mary Beck is growing, Brunswick is growing, and we've invested in transport which is sustainable and accessible. In just eight years in government, the Andrews Labor government has or will deliver the Melbourne Metro Tunnel, which is an $11 billion project which will increase capacity on the upfield line by 71%. It will link up, uh, it will deliver a new train station in Parkville and link up tram routes on Sydney Road. The project will be delivered 12 months ahead of schedule. We've removed 66 level crossings throughout Melbourne, meaning trains don't have to compete with traffic so they can run more frequently. And we've just announced that we're going to make Brunswick completely level crossing free, creating a dedicated bike path to the city, four, MCG worth, four MCGs worth of green space and reducing congestion across Brunswick. We've upgraded trams, we're ensuring our entire tram network runs on 100% renewable energy and we're making them more accessible. We're commencing construction on the suburban rail loop, which is a massive project which will transform our city and how we move around and connect all Melbourne train lines in the middle suburbs and Faulkner on the upfield line and create stations for the first time at Australia's biggest university, Monash, and also at Deakin Burwood. The significance of the suburban rail loop for taking cars off, road, off the road and for transforming the face of the city cannot be overstated. It will completely transform Melbourne and um, I'm looking forward to that project being started next year. We have commenced construction on the Melbourne Airport rail link, which takes, also takes a huge number of cars off the road and especially off Bell Street, which is the main arterial to the airport. We're ensuring that trains and trams are built in Victoria after the previous Liberal government offshored their construction um, and now we've brought them back uh, to have them constructed here. In relation to Brunswick, these are my priorities. Um, we've increased tram services on Sydney Road and train services on the upfield line. We've upgraded the cycling and walking paths in Marybeck, made Nicholson Street tram accessible, and we're making the Route 58 tram accessible as well. And of course, as I mentioned, Brunswick will be level crossing free in 2027, reducing emissions and enhancing accessible and active forms of transport in the process. But there's still more work to do and that's why I'm running to be the local Labor MP here and to deliver locally. Labor's investment, investment in transport is unmatched and historic, but it is under threat if the Liberals win at the next election. And in this room, we can often see this contest as one between Labor and the Greens, but in reality, it's uh, a broader contest between Labor and the Liberals, because the Liberals have said they won't build the suburban rail loop, and the last time they were in government, they didn't deliver any public transport improvements. We're now at a unique moment where we have a state and federal Labor government which is serious about transport infrastructure and serious about acting on climate change. So to quote that famous line from Hamilton, I want to be in the room where it happens and imagine what we can achieve in Brunswick if we have an active, local, progressive Labor member who will listen and deliver the things that people in Brunswick want to see happen. That's why I'm running to be elected, for Brunswick to be in the room where it happens and to give Brunswick the best advocacy inside this government so that we can take full advantage of the enormous investment of public transport that's happening all around us and right here in our suburb. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mike.
The next speaker is Evan Mulholland, who is the lead Liberal candidate for the Northern Metropolitan Region. I invite you to speak now to the audience for six minutes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional elders or Wurundjeri people on, um, and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Jonathan Gregg, the Transport Forum, um, uh, for having us today and hosting uh, this important event. Also, I'd like to acknowledge um, fellow candidates uh, in the room, uh, particularly uh, I'd like to acknowledge Fiona Patton, who's not here, unfortunately. Um, I know she's been in my prayers and many of yours as well, so I hope to see her uh, on the recovery on the men very soon. Um, uh, thanks so much for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, looking forward to sharing with you some liberal ideas on on how we better connect our uh, transport infrastructure. Um, uh, you might think as a Liberal candidate I'd be a bit unfamiliar to this transport forum, but I was standing on this stage four years ago as a Liberal candidate for Northern Metro, um, uh, so it's good to be back. Um, then I was the number two candidate. I was quite unsuccessful in the 2018 election. Um, good to be back as the number one Liberal candidate uh, for the Upper House. Hopefully I'm a little more successful this time. Um, uh, I think it's overwhelmingly a good thing to have the Liberal Party, a, a sensible party of government here representing people of Brunswick. Uh, I acknowledge that some of you, or maybe most of you, might not uh, dream of supporting the Liberal Party, but I think it's really important for democracy that you hear us out and we also listen to you as well, and that's something I hope to impart uh, here tonight. Um, now, I've got a confession to make. Uh, something some of you might not expect from a Liberal, but I am a public transport nerd. Uh, I catch public transport most places. Uh, I live out in Watsonia North in the outer northern suburbs, which requires me to get into the city to catch a bus and then a train, uh, or to get anywhere in the north to get a bus to Plenty Road and then a tram up Plenty Road. So I am passionate about public transport and how we better connect our public transport buses, trams and trains. Um, on a broader level, I'd like to, I want the Liberal Party, and, and the Liberal Party wants to take the politics out of infrastructure. Um, uh, I think Labor at times have used transport as a political weapon. Uh, when they came to government, they too said they'd like to take the politics out of infrastructure, and we, as a, as a party, applauded the creation of Infrastructure Victoria, um, but then they've proceeded to ignore it in the most part. Um, the Liberal Party want to make transport boring again. We want to focus on the minor but very important and the crucial but boring. This uh, means bus route reform, extending train lines and policy that is guided and recommended by the experts. I want a Liberal Party and the Liberal Party to be utterly predictable on transport. No more politics with hard hats to win votes, politics that will do, uh, transport that will deliver real economic benefit. Uh, in that regard, I want to talk to you about the suburban rail loop. The suburban rail loop uh, is business case that would produce between $1 and $1.70 in benefits for every $1 invested. But the Auditor General then said the suburban rail loop east would lose 51 cents in the dollar. I'm old enough to remember Labor whinging that the east-west business case was economic vandalism uh, for producing just seven, 74 cents in the dollar, but now they're willing to roll over for less for the Premier's vanity project. Labor still hasn't submitted the SRL business case to Infrastructure Australia. Um, uh, the Parliamentary Budget Office has predicted the SRL will cost $120 billion for the first two stages. We are talking ast astronomical numbers that will cannibalise public transport infrastructure for the next generation. I can't find a single transport policy or infrastructure expert that supports it. Professor Michael Buxton from RMIT called the station placement designs the world's worst practice. The Australian Population and Research Institute says it's not needed, not fit for purpose, and is a debt bomb. And the Grattan Institute says it's time to pause the project and let the dust settle. And as we found out, Cabinet didn't even know about the project until it was announced, nor did the Department of Transport. Instead, the pro uh, project had been worked on by Development Victoria, outsourced to consultants and with only the knowledge of four ministers. I would much rather see our state on a pathway towards preparing for Metro 2 
and if you support Metro 2, it will be severely delayed and affected by the SRL. Building Metro 2 is the only way to enable us to upgrade frequency. On the upfield line, uh, there's no point upgrading level crossings if you have no plan to increase frequency. Uh, it makes the Brunswick level crossing removals a road project, not a public transport project. We'll have more to say on transport announcements, but I'd like to kind of give you an indication of our thinking. I'd love to see a duplication of the up, uh, upfield line, uh, particularly a connection to Roxburgh Park through Craigieburn, and then an electrification to Wobblin. That's the only way you're going to increase uh, frequency on the upfield line. Uh, while Labor are focused on flash announcements uh, rather than the unsexy ba uh, basics, like crucial upgrades to uh, power and signalling along the uh, along the route. Um, so that's kind of where our thinking is at. Um, Wallen is actually the most northern tip of the northern metro electorate, so I'd very much like to see that kind of project a reality. Um, and as your hopeful next member for Northern Metro, I can assure you I'm busy advocating for these projects and also busy advocating for accessibility around Sydney Road tram stops. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evan. Our final speaker in this first segment is the Reason candidate for Brunswick, Shay Evans, and I invite you to speak to the audience now, Shay. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for having us. So thank you to the uh, MFT and to Marybeck Council as well. It's great to finally be able to say that I live in Marybeck. Uh, I'm a very proud uh, local man. Um, and that leads me to then also acknowledge that traditional people have been living here for over 60,000 years, and so it's to their elders, past, present, and emerging, who I pay respect, because they've uh, been involved in transport for a much longer time than we have around here. Um, so I think that that is salient to say. Also, thank you so much for the comments around uh, and, and the well wishes for Fiona. Um, as has been said, she had her kidney out today, so I'm subbing in for her, but I am the Reason candidate for Brunswick. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and to speak with you all. So, Reason. Who's heard of Reason? A lot of people have heard of Reason because of the great advocacy work that Fiona has done over her last two terms in Parliament. Reason is a human-centred, evidence-based party that really looks at how people can live their best lives and also at protecting the lives that people want to live. For Brunswick and Northern Metro, um, more specifically, Fiona has been able to, in her last two terms, advocate for things that make people's lives easier. So whether that be public transport, whether that be uh, walking, whether that be cycling, Fiona has, in many instances, said and advocated on behalf of her constituents. Reason uh, has, has the following policies around um, efficient public transport. So it's not just about building it, it's making sure that it is useful and it is usable. So we want to increase public transport spending. We want higher growth areas to receive more uh, spending. But we also want the access and the frequency increased as well. And you can only do that by increasing spending on public transport. It should also be made more accessible by using things like free Wi-Fi, it should, uh, trains and buses and uh, trams should also have the ability to be able to carry all sorts of passengers. And at the moment, if you were to ever take a bus replacement, you'll know that that sometimes isn't accessible for people, uh, especially considering cyclists or people that want to carry things on replacement buses that can't on trams. It's been great to hear that the Labor government want to spend a lot of money removing level crossings here in Brunswick, and of course Reason applaud that. But to make sure that it's done in the correct fashion, to make sure that it's done in an accessible and inclusive fashion, is something that Reason will be advocating for, for the people of Brunswick. It's a lot of work, and it's work that will go on for a long time. And we don't want people to be put out by the work that will happen. We want to bring them on that journey. We want them to be able to uh, enjoy the success that that will bring to the local area. 
So making sure that inclusion and accessibility as it is at the forefront of any new transport uh, developments that happen. We also have a priority on walking and cycling, so active transport. And active transport should be something that the community has a lot of say over. It's no good the state government drawing up different plans for smaller communities that, may, that they may or may not understand. However, it is very much within the state government's purview to give money to local areas to make sure that uh, active walking and cycling happens uh, in a much more uh, even way or way that is more congregant to the local area. So we would like to see a priority on walking and cycling infrastructure for local governments. And that's things like uh, investment in, in safe and direct continuous bike routes that are separated from traffic flows and the revitalisation of existing trails, um, whether they be for walking or cycling. Now, in mentioning this, none of this will happen if we also fail to do anything about the climate crisis. We know that that is the most existential threat facing us as a civilization and indeed a community. So, with that in mind, the idea that the government is spending a lot of money is great, fantastic. However, what reason want to see is future plans. Yeah, great, plan for the next term. No worries. Reason would love a seat at the table to be able to advocate for Brunswick if we're having those conversations. But we need to be planning for 2030, 2040, 2050, the year 2000, and the year 21,000, that's, that's a year. So we see these longer, terms, longer term plans much more important as well. So whilst reason may never make government this time, what we would like is a seat at the table to be able to advocate better for the local community, to making sure that inclusion and access for the community is at the forefront of what the government has in plan. And we're willing to work with anyone on good ideas that have sound reason and evidence. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Shay, and thank you to all the speakers. We're now at the Q&A part of the evening. I'd, I'd just like to reiterate the, Melbourne, uh, the Metropolitan Transport Forum's commitment to accessibility and for everyone in our community to be able to participate in these events. So o over the next 55 minutes or so, I, I just want to ensure that people in the audience have the ability not only to hear and see the speakers, but also to participate in the Q&A if they so wish. Um, if you have any um, needs that haven't already been accommodated, we are keen to do so. And if, if you or your carer will make those needs known to one of our concierges, I'll remind you who they are. We have uh, Craig Griffiths, Craig, and we have Sue Sullivan. Sue is up, right up the back there, and bo both of them are ready and willing to assist anyone with any special needs in order to fully participate in this program. What I'd like to do now is um, go to the other candidates who are running in the Northern Metropolitan Region and the City of Brunswick to ask the first questions. And um, I'd ask Craig to give the microphone now to Jerome Small, who is the Victorian Socialist candidate for the Upper House Region of Northern Metro. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, and when I was asking Greg about the format of this evening, he was explaining I might have a minute to put a couple of propositions and invite a response uh, from the panel and from the audience, of course. So I'll see how many I get through. I think proposition number one, we need massive expansion of orbital bus routes in suburbs like Mickleham and Craigieburn, because as long as you need to walk for... Oh. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that better? Okay, all right. We need massive expansion. Is that, can I talk without it? Is that just booming? Is that? Microphone is better. Okay, all right, thank you. Sorry, just checking. We need, in my opinion, and I'm interested in the response, we need a massive expansion of orbit, orbital bus routes in growth suburbs like Mickleham and Craigieburn. Because as long as there's suburbs like Mickleham where you need to walk maybe five kilometres from your house to get a bus and then need to wait maybe 40 minutes to get a bus, 
Traffic will continue to choke our streets in Mickleham, in Craigieburn, in every arterial road coming into the city and here in the inner city. Public transport is a game where nobody really wins unless everybody wins. That's proposition number one. Proposition number two is public ownership. I do not understand why we still keep tipping $2.7 billion into privatised services and the Labor government had an opportunity to take the train service back in 2017 with no legal ramifications at all and they passed on that opportunity. Proposition number three, it should be free. Why give one more reason to jump in a car? Proposition number four, it has to be accessible. And I was at a, a small protest just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the Disability Resource Centre is highlighting the very slow rollout of accessible uh, transport. And finally, people power works. The fact that you can catch the upfield rail line shows that people power works. So let's keep it up, let's step it up and fight for the public transport we need. Thank you very much. I was putting some propositions that could be commented on by the, uh, by the audience and by the, by the people here. Public transport, what do you think? Should it be free? Should it be accessible? Should it be publicly owned? And do we need a massive expansion of orbital bus routes in the outer suburbs? Th thank, thank you, you Jerome, for that question. And apologies. And um, I'll, I'll now uh, ask the speakers in order of seating, and, and then we'll mix it up later. To, to respond to Jerome's question. Mike, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, sorry, I, I, should, I should have said, um, what, what I might do is leave the microphone with Craig. Sure, and I should come up there. Yeah, yes, and, and th that would be easier for the live stream audience as well. So if, if you'd like to join me at the podium now. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, look, thanks for that. Uh, those series of propositions and, and questions, Jerome. Um, they're, they're all, you touch on important issues, all of them. Um, I'm really proud of what the government's managed to do over the last eight years in terms of expanding transport, particularly to the, to the outer suburbs. And I'm, uh, I think that's only gonna continue when we have projects like the Suburban Rail Loop, which needs to happen, uh, continue. Um, I, I'm also really proud of what the government has done in terms of um, expanding bus routes uh, and, and, and upgrading bus routes right across Melbourne. To go to your proposition around, to go to your proposition around uh, the, um, I'm starting to lose what the proposition was, the proposition around public transport, what, should it be free? Should it be, should, public transport absolutely should be accessible, okay? So on the accessibility question, uh, we uh, again, I think, have a proud record of making public transport accessible. There's, there's more to do um, on that. And if I'm elected as the Labor MP, it'll be top of, pro top of my, uh, it'll be top of my priority to ensure that all modes of transport in the area that I represent are accessible. Uh, we have, this government has, is made a commitment to make all the tram stops in Melbourne accessible. We've done that on Nicholson Street. Uh, we're doing that on uh, the Route 58 um, tram. Um, there's been 68 million in the budget this year to do that in the CBD. Um, part, of the pick, part of that will be getting the stock um, and ensuring that the rolling stock is available to make all those trams accessible, and that's being done now. But certainly, if I'm the local MP, accessibility, uh, accessibility right across Marybeck and right across Moreland will be, uh, sorry, right across Brunswick and Marybeck will be top of, uh, top of my list. Um, maybe I should give the microphone now to somebody else for, for the other propositions. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Mike, um, so we'll move now to Tim, and uh, you'll have two minutes to respond to Jerome's question, which I'm phrasing as free, accessible, and expanded public transport. Two minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, that was a good essay topic there. Um, I'll take it slightly out of order. At the rate at which we're making tram stops accessible will be done by the year 2066. I'm not sure I'll be around to catch one of those trams, but uh, the Greens uh, are in the process of costing getting it done and we believe that it could be done much faster. And in fact, for the cost of one level crossing removal, just one, we could do around 100 tram stops. So that, that, ought, that ought to be a priority. The, 
public transport should be free and is free in some cities in the world and it's a reasonable, I, you know, I support that call. We, I don't think we've costed that, however, we certainly called for it around the COVID recovery period and I think particularly it would be a good thing to start with uh, for children and students and, and work up from there as a way of doing that and we should over the longer term seize those opportunities when they come around again to bring back the public transport system into public ownership. It wouldn't be as expensive as people think because we're, already, we're paying for it all the time and, uh, and the government is subsidising it. So it's well and truly possible. Orbital bus routes was your other thing and, and the Greens have costed and announced a significant bus policy and for the outer suburbs or for anywhere Buses are the cheapest way to rapidly expand public transport. There are entire suburbs that get no public transport at all and buses could be running there in a month. It's not hard to organise and we've announced a policy of uh, building locally 3,000 electric buses, which is the way we ought to be going now. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Exactly on time. We move now to uh, the, the third respondent, Evan, who has two minutes now to respond to Jerome's question concerning free, accessible and expanded public transport. No worries. Thanks for the question, uh, Jerome. I was actually chatting to Greg earlier that I'd love a transport forum, a public transport forum in Mickleham, because um, there's not much public transport going in Mickleham. So, um, and that's a, quite a great shame. So I'd, I'd love to see uh, I'm right with you on that, on, on public transport there, and it's a main concern for locals as well. As I said earlier, I'm a public transport cons uh, nerd, so if you look at um, where Sydney is up to with the Sydney Metro, automated trains that come every seven minutes through to outer growth areas, uh, we're just decades behind on public transport through a lack of planning um, uh, on a public transport level. Um, uh, on the accessible, uh, Daniel Andrews promised years ago that these tram stops will be upgraded, uh, but they haven't, um, and it's barely a fraction of the way there. That's not according to me, that's according to the Auditor General. So we're definitely keen to stop the blame game. Daniel Andrews is quick to blame councils for, for lack of progress. Um, we're just keen to make it a priority and ensure that state government is actually complying with, um, with, with federal disability law as well. Um, on the free public transport, we have announced a policy that uh, public transport is actually going to be free for health workers. We think that's a really important signal to our health work workers to get our, uh, our workforce back going again. Uh, and um, you know, certainly on merit, um, the, uh, I don't think the argument's there entirely for free public transport. We do need uh, to pay for our public transport as well, which is why I'll stress that the suburban rail loop on some measures is going to cost $200 billion dollars our uh, GSP is 400 billion. There's no way we can improve our public transport infrastructure if we continue with the suburban rail loop. So thank you. Thank you, Evan. And finally, Shay, would you like to respond to Jerome's question? Yeah, thanks for the question, Jerome. Um, on the first topic of it being free, it is something that we support in theory. However, Reason would want to see what the numbers around that would be. It is. Wonderful to have a public transport system, but it does have to be funded. Um, however, um, for certain sections of the community, there is a, a definite strong case for it to be free. And we've seen that free public transport in the city does work. Um, to, for it to be accessible, also 100% can't echo that enough. It should be accessible and it should be accessible at all times for all people. Um, and that includes things. Um, like when there are upgrades of rail lines, um, sometimes buses just aren't accessible. Um, and so making sure that there are safeguards and that there are things in place to make it accessible always, a, a system needs to be accessible. And then just to touch on the expansion of like orbital systems around trains as well, it, buses work. Um, that being said, buses aren't necessarily that popular. Um, there are a lot of bus routes that do service a lot of Melbourne, uh, but they're not necessarily well used. Um, so looking forward into the, into the future, there are a few things that cities have started to do around small, moving smaller groups of people around, and whether or not that be um, electric, autonomous electric vehicles that are much smaller and are able to be a lot more um, 
uh, able to dodge traffic a lot better or be a lot more nimble or take shorter routes. It's something that we should be looking at as a state um, because just to keep saying, yes, well, we'll put buses in and make people take buses, they're there at the moment, but are they being well used? So to really look at the future, um, I think is what needs to happen around our train lines, which are main arterials for people catching public transport. So we're going to get people to the trains. One of the candidates, uh, Tim, has suggested that we shrink the answers to one minute, which I think is a wise choice. I was just doing some calculations and I've got a, four speakers lined up, uh, four questioners lined up, and that will take up the remainder of the questions. But if people are happy with that format change, then we can certainly run through a lot more. Um, in which case, uh, I've, I've got three, and I've, I'm, I'm taking a question from that gentleman there. Um, and then, so, sorry, I've, I've, I've got a speakers list now of five people, and I'm trying to balance gender, age, um, I, I, and there, there was another woman asking over here, I think, uh, I think she's, okay, so, that, that one there, yep, great, great, okay, so we've basically filled the, 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 the question list already, um, because of the time remaining. That's on the proviso that we give short, snappy answers of um, less than one minute. So I'll, I'll direct you, Craig, to, to the, the questioner. The next one comes from Leah Horsfall, who is the animal justice candidate for the Northern Metropolitan Region. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so um, as Jonathan said, I'm with the Animal Justice Party. And one of our core values is equality. So coming here tonight, I was very much at the forefront of my mind was the cost of public transport. Um, there's physical accessibility, there's a frequency, it's, it's great topics that need to be canvassed. But I was a bit disappointed that no one talked about affordability until Jerome. So thank you, Jerome. Um, but my question that I'm going to take the opportunity to ask is just to Mike, um, because I don't think you, you answered that one um, addressed it sort of directly, as the other candidates did. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts about the cost of transport because, um, you know, not everyone lives in a spot where they can ride a bike, not everyone can afford an electric car. Bringing down the cost for everyone is a really important consideration in improving access. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. And uh, I, I think what I'll do, if it's not too much trouble, is just... Um, no, it's, it's stay in, in that order. It, it'd be good if you did to the podium so that our listeners at home and who are re-watching the broadcast can, can hear it through the microphone. So I invite you, Mike, to, to speak for less than one minute to Leah's question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a, I mean, it's a really important question and we are um, in the middle of a cost of living crisis at the moment. So the cost um, of public transport to people um, is, is, a really significant, is a really significant issue. So thanks very much for raising it. Um, there are already, um, as, as people know, there are already a range of, um, a range of concessions uh, that uh, people can draw on when they use public transport. Um, I'm not saying that they're always enough uh, for people, but, but certainly uh, for students, for um, healthcare card holders, um, for people who are retired, um, the, the cost of access to public transport is lower. Uh, and for healthcare card holders as well. And as well, uh, the government has made uh, the tram network in the CBD uh, that is also free to use. Uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of access, in terms of accessing it uh, at close to, where people, close to where people live, I think the government has a really proud record on that and we're, we're doing that now um, in terms of things like suburban rail loop, that's going to be an enormous, um, that's going to be an enormously important in terms of people accessing public transport. Um, I think I've been given the bell, but, but I would say that there are already concessions in place, um, so I don't have an announcement to make now about, um, you know, further reducing those or, or making public transport, um, you know, free, as it were. Um, has anyone heard of the Vampire Index, which is the vulnerability index for mortgage, petroleum, uh, inflation, risks and expenditure. It was 
a, a measure developed by RMIT, and the people who are at greatest risk for these price rises are the outer suburban low-income people with heavily mortgaged homes who drive old polluting cars with high petrol consumptions into their cleaning job in the inner city. And those people are the ones that need the most help. And so th that's one group in particular I would want to target with uh, capping maximum public transport fees so that they're not uh, paying a whole lot more uh, for using public transport. So that's, that's the group I would start with, with helping. So outer suburban people uh, should not have to pay a whole lot more to come in than inner suburban people who live in, in more expensive accommodation. Thanks for your question, really appreciate it. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we do have a, a policy about um, free public transport for um, health workers, um, and I think that's really important. It's also just also really important to acknowledge there is a cost of living crisis under the Andrews government, particularly um, those people in the outer suburbs that have to uh, travel a long way. Um, I, I think the connectivity between our transport infrastructure is really important. Um, not everyone can afford an electric vehicle at the moment, unfortunately. I, I certainly can't afford to, to um, cop, you know, over 60 grand, uh, which is what an electric vehicle uh, costs, but I'd like to be able to, to buy an electric scooter, uh, as you've seen many around the city. Currently under the Andrews government, it's illegal to ride around a privately owned electric scooter. Um, I don't understand that. I don't understand why that's still the case, um, but I know um, cycling is not for everyone. I, I dabbled in it at one stage. Um, not for me, I'm not as fit anymore, but a lot of people would like to and do uh, ride electric scooters, so I'd like to see that legalised. I think this speaks to a larger problem. It's not just transport that we're talking about, it is the cost of living. It's making sure that people have access to the things that help them out on a day to day and decrease their living costs. So whether that be housing, whether that be education, whether that be uh, access to work, um, it, it's helping out people with those kind of social services that bring down their cost of living and they're able to then afford things like public transport. That being said, um, to invest a lot more in public transport would be great. So to have it more uh, available for people to be able to use as well, which would then see use rates go up, uh, is fantastic. And as I said before, making sure that certain vulnerable groups have access to that free public transport, which is imperative for them to be able to live their lives and do the things that they need to do. Thank you so much, Shay, for concluding the panel response to that question. I have another five speakers on our list which will take us through to the end of the session before the speakers get to sum up. Our next question comes from the back of the audience and I'd like to ask you, sir, to, to ask your question now. Uh, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Christian. And I am an advocate that has been working in the disability sector for 15 years. I've been working uh, full, full time. And I, I find very interesting the conversation tonight about inclusion because based on what I have experienced, I can tell you guys that we are very far from inclusion. And because tonight this forum is about public transport, let's focus on transport only. Now, uh, one of the big issues that I see is uh, to look at uh, people with a disability to be a priority and being able to contribute to society like everyone. 
But how can we do that if a public transport, which is the main uh, way for us to move around, we cannot even just and cash the transport. So let's focus, for example, on Sydney Road trams. You've got a lot of low floor tram on Route 19. Beautiful. They look absolutely great. The problem is we cannot use them. So, what is the point of having low floor trams if you cannot use them? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, very topical, as you know. Um, Thank you. And I'd, I'd like to put that question. What is the point of having low four trams if you can't use them on Sydney Road? I'd like to invite, um, perhaps we'll start from this end, Shay, and we'll go back the other way. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, it is the number one thing that Fiona gets asked in relation to public transport on Sydney Road, is why do we not have accessible stops? It makes no sense. You are 100% correct. It makes no sense to have low floor, low floor trams if you can't get on them. So that's something that we at the Reason Party really heavily want to advocate for, is that accessibility to be able to get onto a tram. Especially on Sydney Road, we know how busy it is. And to have the links through Sydney Road and surrounding communities that people are able to then access those stops on Sydney Road as well. So it's not just enough to build them, but you've got to have the infrastructure around that for people to be able to get to and from their houses or their places of work um, to those accessible stops. Thank you so much for the question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, even the Auditor General has had a, a good look at this and said it's not good enough. We're only a fraction of the way on where we should be in accessible tram stops. And, I think by December this year, uh, the state government will be in breach on federal legislation covering disability access as well. So I know um, our transport infrastructure shadow, Matt Back, has done many transport forums and he said that this is an area of great priority for him and the Liberal Party and I hope to take up that cause as well on your behalf. So we've had 40 years or more of activism from the disability community pushing for accessible public transport and in particular accessible tram stops for the, most of the last 20 years the current Labor government has been ignoring that and the rate at which we're building these accessible tram stops is painfully slow as I said before not just for wheelchair users, but for elderly people with walking frames, for people pushing prams and so on. And as I've said, for a, a much lower cost than the grander public transport projects that have been announced, we could do all of Sydney Road. Right now there's only two accessible stops on Sydney Road, one at each end, one just down here at Royal where Royal Parade ends, and the other one at the terminus and nothing in between. So to answer the question, what is the point of low floor trams? There's no point. And Sydney Road needs this kind of investment. And while we're jackhammering and digging, digging up Sydney Road to put in accessible tram stops, let's put in some safe bike lanes as well. Thanks. Look, thanks very much for that question and I think that you have the same right to access public transport as everyone else in this room and the reason that I'm running to get into politics is to deliver those things. Um, I just want to say as no excuse um, for why we don't have accessible tram stops on Sydney Road yet um, that we are, um, Melbourne has the largest tram network in the world. Um, so the accessibility issue, the accessibility issue is 
is, will absolutely be front of mind um, and it's something that I'm going to advocate for if I get elected. If you have a Labor MP in Brunswick, you will see that this issue is progressed. It hasn't been progressed over the last four years. I will be able to advocate for it and I will be able to, I will be able to progress it if I'm elected. Thank you, Mike. And um, we, we have a, a, a question fr from you and the, the respondents, in, instead of just going back and forth, I, I might skip to you, Evan, then, and then along there and then finishing with you, Shay, just to give it a bit more variety. Please ask your question. G'day, I'm Kenna, a local resident. And uh, a few years ago, there was a extensive consultation on redesigning Sydney Road to A, give accessible tram stops, bicycle lanes, uh, and generally improve it for pedestrians uh, as well. Um, but nothing has happened. Uh, it's been sitting there with the state government for a good while, and nothing has happened. And I guess my question, I guess primarily to Mike, others have addressed it as well I, already, uh, when is it going to happen? Uh, and I guess, you know, fl float the idea is, could bicycle lanes be down between the trams so the pedestrians are not in, are impacted by bicycles? But that's just another thought. Um, so yeah, w when, when will that reconstruction of Sydney Road, which is more than just accessible trams, it includes accessible trams, when will that be happening? Thank, thank you for the question. So I, I suggest rather than focusing on the previous question which has been answered, that we talk about the entirety of Sydney Road basically from the property boundary to the property boundary um, and the likelihood of including those bicycle lanes which were alluded to in some of the answers. But starting with Evan, then Tim, then Mike and then Shay. Thank you. Thanks so much for your question. I'd certainly like to see where, where that has progressed uh, with Sydney Road. Um, it's deep in area of interest for me. Um, uh, I think there are quite a you know, few issues with Sydney Road. Sydney Road has been, you know, speak to any of the local traders, very, very hard hit by the pandemic. Um, and I'd like to see Sydney Road as a place that people don't just travel through, but travel to. Uh, whether any way we can um, get the get business going, get activity going on Sydney Road is going to be good for the local community and benefit the local community. Um, I come from a place where I don't think we should be pitting uh, different transport users against each other. I think we need to find a, a, a Sydney Road that works for every kind of transport, including cars, including pedestrians, including cyclists, including people that um, use e-scooters. Um, uh, however way you travel, uh, we need to make sure we have a Sydney road that works for everyone uh, that is accessible as well. Thanks for the question. So Sydney road should be a destination. It's one of the longest retail shopping, high street shopping strips that there is. It's a great place to visit, but the footpaths are narrow. You're surrounded by parked cars, traffic fumes, noise, it's unsafe to ride your bike on, and as we know, you can't get off a tram on a wheelchair. So, it needs a full revitalisation. And when should it be done? It should be started very soon, because when the level crossing removal takes place behind us, that bike path will be closed for at least a year. So I can't tell you when it will happen, but I can tell you when it should happen. It should happen right now. The pop-up bike lane should start now, at least for the length of the level crossing removal. That's the logical spot to start. You could do it with a bit of plastic and have it up and running in a month. We've costed it a couple of million bucks and you could get as far as Blythe Street, a couple of million more you could get up to Albion. Thanks very much for the question. I, I, I liked that the fact that the question was addressed to me as though I were the local member. Um, if I were the local, you need to get the Sydney revitalisation going and shout out to the Sydney revitalisation group and all the people that have done the work on that. 
Uh, to get Sydney Road the destination that we want it to be and to unlock the potential of Sydney Road and to make it the economic and education and cultural hub that we want it to be, um, I think we need a Labor member in government uh, in this area to do that. And I think if we compare what uh, High Street Northcote has looks like in comparison to what Sydney Road looks like, it would be a very different. It would be a very different story. What I would do if I were elected as the Labor MP is I would get everyone around the table. I would meet with the bureaucrats. I would meet with the ministers. I would meet with the local government. I would meet with all the stakeholders, and I would drive that process. And I would ask people to hold me to that at the end of the four years um, after my election. Anyone that's driven down Sydney Road at any time of day uh, is always stuck in traffic. We know what it's like. It is an absolute nightmare to even attempt on a Saturday. Uh, and so Reason has a great uh, history of advocacy, ad advocating in these um, type of situations. Uh, as the candidate for Brunswick, I'm very passionate about Sydney Road. Um, I've lived off Sydney Road in my past. Um, and I see how important it is, not only to the local area, but as a destination. That is very true. And so to come to some sort of compromise that all road users can use it effectively um, is a really important thing to do. It should be safe for cyclists. It should be safe for pedestrians. It should allow the flow of traffic. It should, uh, be accessible. It should have accessible, accessible tram stops. It's a really important, vital, arterial road in our, uh, in our electorate. And it's something that people really do need to get around the table on and sort out reason are very passionate about wanting that to happen and about making that happen. Wonderful. Thank you for the question. So we, we now have uh, three questions remaining and we'll speed through them. I'd like to invite you, sir, to ask your question. Thanks. Uh, my name's Nick McClellan. I'm a member of the Brunswick Residence Network. We heard a lot tonight about transport initiatives for the community, but the experience of people around here is they're often done to the community. Um, the experience of what happened with uh, crossings further north was really poor engagement and consultation with the community, ripping down trees at Gandalfo Park and so on. We're about to go through it again. So I've heard a lot about inclusivity tonight, but I've heard absolutely nothing concrete about how people are going to engage with the community. What would you do as a local member to ensure that the Department of Transport, LXRA and other state institutions actually engage with people who are affected? So not just inclusivity. Give us some something concrete. What would you do? Thank you for the question. Um, we'll start with Tim, Mike, Shay, and then Evan. Thanks. Thank you. Good question. The LXRA didn't really do consultation with the Coburg Elevated Rail. They did something they called consultation, but it was really de detailed information sessions. They provided lots of information, but they really didn't alter the project in any meaningful way to reflect the wishes of the community. And since then, uh, well, during that project, I've been collecting feedback from residents and protesting, raising their issues in Parliament repeatedly, and I think have a very strong record of advocating for the affected residents over the time of that project. It'll be the same here, but with that experience in mind, we'll start earlier. And I think we need to do two things. We need to identify what are the issues most important to the residents who will be most affected, the, the, those living closest to the line. And we need to narrow down to a small number of relatively realistic asks and absolutely put them front and centre in Parliament in front of the Minister. Thanks, Nick. That's a great question. Um, if I were elected as the MP in Brunswick, what I would do is adopt the process that occurred uh, in the level crossing removal project uh, in the Caulfield to Dandenong line, which was led by Steve Demopoulos chairing the community consultation and driving the community consultation. And that way, uh, what you have is you have the local member 
uh, being held to account for all the things that the community raises. If you look at that consultation, it was a meaningful one, and the outcome that the community got there, which involved Skyrail, um, was an absolutely outstanding outcome. Um, it was driven by the local member, and the local member took responsibility for each aspect of the consultation. So it will be a process, um, I think, of uh, me as the local member taking these things up with the Labor Ministers, hopefully if we get back into government, and I think that will prove to be a much more effective uh, consultation process. Thank you. Yeah, really good question. Um, ultimately, it, it really is down to what the residents want. It's what they want along that corridor, um, and essentially it's having that really strong consultation. So as, as running as a candidate for Brunswick, I would love to lead that consultation and make sure that what the residents need and want along that corridor is really taken into account. Uh, the, the, the fact that the government goes about and announces these type of things without too much consultation really shows the level, um, I guess, of, of ignoring the community and really understanding what it is that might affect them in the first place and putting the safeguards in place of making sure that those things don't happen. So that's what I think that really ultimately needs to happen in situations like this, is ensuring that all user groups, both residents and people who are going to be using the upfield line, are consulted, the things that they concern them are brought to the fore and that those things are worked on first and foremost. Thanks so much for your question. Um, I, I remember four years ago working quite closely with the Don't Raise the Mall and Bell group uh, on the lack of consultation they were given about um, the Sky Rail there. Um, and you know, on consultation, our transport uh, shadow, Matt Back, has made consultation quite a high priority up on his list. Um, and, and on that, there just wasn't any consultation on on the level crossing removals further down the line. So I don't have any faith that there will be more under this government. I know they even locked out the Greens local MP out of any local cons consultation as well. So you have to include the local MPs as part of the consultation. I think that's really important, regardless of what electorate it's going through. I know many electorates where, the Liberal electorates where there were level crossing removals, those local MPs were locked out of their communities as well. And as has been discussed, it was more like an information se se session than in a genuine two-way consultation. I mean, you know, everyone I speak to around here and further up says duplicate the uh, rail line to upfield, uh, but Labor comes out and says, oh, we're going to do level crossings, but going to do nothing about frequency. So genuine consultation would include that as well. Thank you all. Um, so I still see people indicating they'd like to ask a question. I've, I've filled the speakers list, unfortunately, um, but I, I am trying to squeeze one more questioner in, and I've made a list of speakers who, if we have the time, will make a question. It's probably up to the candidates to perhaps um, shorten their answers if you'd like to get through more quickly. I, I think one minute is, is reasonable, but um, we could probably squeeze in one more question. I have three questioners remaining. I have them on the list. Uh, the next one comes from you, sir. Go. Hello, I'm a member of the series Bike Shed, and we have members who come in and fix bikes who feel unsafe riding even in to fix their own equipment. Um, it is beyond an established fact in planning that safe, protected bike lanes, not pa uh, paint on the side of the road, is necessary for people to get around safely, feel safe, actually get out and increase numbers, and for gender diversity in cycling. Um, over the last uh, decade or so, the state government has come out and uh, released plans that say that they're going to increase safety in cycling, but in reality, anyone in Brunswick who actually cycles knows that this is not eventuated in any reasonable capacity, especially when connecting the east and the west. Um, I want to know if any of the candidates uh, want to put forward a safe, protected bike lane that is both north-south connected and east-west connected. Thank you for your question. Um, We'll start with, with um, Mike and then Shay and then Evan and then Tim. And if, if, if we can run through the um, quickly, then, then, then we'll squeeze in one last question from Council Bolton. Thank you. Yeah, shout out to the work that Ceres does, which is a, an enormous uh, asset to our community. Um, very quickly, uh, the government recently announced uh, over a million dollars uh, to look at the uh, Mary, Mary Creek 
uh, trail and the uh, Capital City Trail and the missing links between those and how we can join those um, join those up. We are about to have um, we're about to get the the best bike path in Victoria on the upfield line, a dedicated bike path with lots of green open space. Um, not competing with pedestrians, which will go all the way from Coburg to the city. Um, and uh, you're absolutely correct about pointing to the issue of the east-west um, connections with bike paths, which we need to, uh, you know, we obviously need to um, improve those connections, but easing congestion with level crossing removals, uh, we, will see, we will see cars come off the road through that. It's a huge safety issue, just not for bi not just for bikes, but also for pedestrians as well. So there's nothing to say that the there shouldn't be a push for safer bike routes that both go north to south, but also east to west. They should be linking with each other as well. It's not good enough to just say, oh yeah, we are going to have a huge bike um, path up the upfield line. That doesn't necessarily service our entire community. We need dedicated bike lanes that are protected from traffic, that service the community as a whole. That not only keeps current cyclists safe, but it does increase people or increase the want of people to want to take up cycling. It makes people feel safe and think, oh yeah, I could possibly do this myself. So it comes back into that accessibility and inclusion aspect as well. So ensuring that cyclists are safe is a major priority for the Reason Party. Um, thanks so much for your question. Um, certainly agree that cyclists need to be kept safe and, and keen to look at any proposals that work for everybody, including safe bike lanes. Um, it is quite a personal uh, issue for me as well. A uh, very close relative uh, was hospitalised after um, having a car door opened on her. So um, uh, I, I know the fear that goes into cyclists every day uh, not wanting them to, to happen for themselves. So it is something that I'm keen to see as a priority. So, Brunswick's got only one separated bike lane and it's less than a kilometre. It's literally a few metres away in Dawson Street running from Sydney Road that way. So that puts in mind the simplest one would be to just extend that along Glen Lyon Road down to the Merry Creek and people could get to Ceres from the west down to Merry Creek and up the Merry Creek path. And Glen Lyon Road's ideal really because it, it has the width. Little problem with some trees on the south side, might have to do some little dodgem stuff there, but I reckon that's where I'd put it. Uh, but I, I don't think we should, because it's a council road, I don't think we should let the state government off the hook. I reckon they should whack one in Moreland Road as well, which is wide enough as well. I think the, the state government hasn't built a single separated bike lane in, in Brunswick, and Moreland Road is east-west, has the space, doesn't have some of the technical issues of Sydney Road. Let's do it. So we're, we're really at time and I've, I had another two questions on the list. So what I propose we do is we hear those two questions and then go immediately to the closing remarks. And if the candidates so choose, they can make reference to those questions as they close with two minutes apiece. So I'm, I'm going to ask um, the, the, the woman in grey to, to stand up and wait for the microphone, ask your question. Um, and then uh, we'll finish with Councillor Bolton. Thank you. Thank you. I'm one of the residents from Safe Access to Bell Street Bridge for Everyone, talking about Bell Street Bridge in Coburg near uh, Elizabeth and Nicholson Streets. I'm also a Coburg High School parent. Coburg High is one of, if not the largest school in the area, secondary and co-ed schools and our active transport rate is at 75%. Yet the main route to school for our students is unseparated footpaths, footpaths that are narrower than uh, Australian requirements, Australian safety standards. We have frequent near misses and last year a student was hit by 
a car in that area. So I'd like to know from the candidates, what will you do to rectify this? Thank you. Thank you for your question. And, um, and then a final question from Councillor Sue Bolton. And both of these questions can, if they so choose, be addressed in the closing remarks. Well, my question is um, two very precise questions. Uh, um, could, could you limit it to, to one, please? Yeah, okay. Uh, one question. I want to see a guaranteed timetable for the upfield line to be duplicated. Unless it's duplicated, there'll be no more trains on the upfield line when the metro tunnel's finished or when the, the level crossings are removed. And the perfect time to do the, do the duplication is while the level crossings have the line out, while that disruption's happening. And the, I want a definite timetable, not 50 years' time, because the inner and the outer suburbs are connected. Crap public transport in the outer suburbs affects the inner suburbs with extra traffic. And we know that as soon as the train is six minutes late, the train is cancelled at Bell Street, leaving everyone north with a cancellation. And if you live north of the train line, you're at jeopardy of losing your job, missing a medical appointment, or um, missing an important exam. If, if, and also, we um, need accessible okay. transport, transport by the time of the Commonwealth Games. We're meant to have accessible tram stops by the December this year for all states. Not a single state has complied with that. We need that to happen at the very least by the time of the Commonwealth Games in 2026, not vaguely in the future. Th thank you. So we, we have two prominent members of the community, a teacher and a councillor, asking the final questions. We won't have time to go through them um, in the same manner as we did before because we're up against it. But it's now time for closing remarks from the candidates. You each, at the beginning, chose a card. Will you hold up your cards now? And this time we'll go in reverse order. So the, the Four of Hearts will be followed by the Three of Hearts, by the Two of Hearts, and then the Ace of Hearts. Four of Hearts, your turn. Two minutes, go. Awesome, thank you. Great points, um, and I think they speak to definite government timelines and promises that governments often make to communities and then they don't see them through. We know that Coburg High is one of the most underfunded high schools in the district, and so the funding around the accessibility of that is key. Uh, we also know that when major infrastructure projects happen, um, it's often people being either moved from their normal transport or moved out from their houses even um, to accommodate those things. And it's having really clear and concise plans for those. Reason cares about people, and ultimately we want people to be able to make decisions about their own lives. Um, but that can only happen if there is strong advocate, advocacy for people in the community to be able to do that. We obviously care, as I've said many times, about inclusion and access, both to transport but in public life. Melbourne is growing. By 2050, there's projected to be 8.5 million people in Melbourne. And if we don't start planning for a better future now, we will end up at a standstill. We will end up with public transport that doesn't work, we'll end up with roads that are congested and clogged, and we'll end up with footpaths that can't accommodate the people that need to walk on them. So long-term planning needs to happen, and it needs to happen in the next term. Reason wants to advocate for this on behalf of Brunswick and on behalf of the community. We want to make sure that people are living in a Melbourne that they can thrive and grow in. Thanks so much. I'm too. Thanks for both of your questions. Um, on the Nicholson Street and Bell, I believe our candidate for Pasco Vale, um, Tom Wright, um, has um, consulted on this and, and we're looking at this very, very closely, so I have more to say about that um, in the future. Um, on the upfield line, uh, you will get no qualms from me, uh, certainly you get no qualms from the community on demanding that happen. It's actually in the, in the pub Public Transport Victoria development plan, and as our shadow Matt Barker said, um, we want to be guided by the experts, we want to make uh, transport infrastructure very boring again, um, so this should be a policy you 
should expect the Liberal Party to pursue and you should expect that the Liberal Party will have more to say about the upfield line soon. I'd love to see it connected uh, and extended, uh, connecting to the Craigie Brown line on Roxford Park and then also having um, electrification to Wallen. Um, and that's why we need to prioritise Metro 2 over the suburban rail loop so we can have that connection to the Frankston line as well and have that upgraded frequency on the upfield line, which I know so many of you have been dem demanding. Uh, it's gone from 100 years ago, the upfield line, to um, was used to taking funeral trains to Faulkner Cemetery uh, and we've augmented it into a Metro rail line. Um, we have a lot to be proud of this rail line, uh, but the last serious uh, upgrades to it were about 1995, so we do need to uh, invest more into the upfield line and have a, a, a line that we can be very proud of connecting all the way through our northern suburbs uh, communities. Um, you're going to see me, hopefully, as the member, the next member for Northern Metro, advocating for public transport infrastructure in the northern suburbs because I believe in public transport infrastructure and believe in the connectivity of our communities and the need for people to get around. So thank you again for all of you for coming tonight. Thanks very much for this uh, really yeah, terrific forum. The questions have been, have been great. Um, just on the first question, and I just want to give a shout out to my colleague Anthony Chanfloni, who's in the, in the crowd, he's running um, as the candidate for Pasco Vale. Anthony and, uh, and Kat Theophanis, I understand, have met, um, met uh, with the group in relation to that issue and are, and are looking into it at the moment. It's a very important issue. Um, uh, it's not one I'm across because it doesn't fall within my, my, um, my area, but I know Anthony's very active on that. In relation to the second issue, and I'm sorry to disappoint you, Sue, um, but the Melbourne Metro Tunnel uh, will... So the Gowry upgrade is an important upgrade, um, the duplication upgrade. Melbourne Metro Tunnel is a, is, will unlock the capacity for the upfield line. That is quite separate to the duplication issue. They're t entirely separate issues. It will increase capacity by 71% because it takes the three busiest train networks on the Melbourne train network out of the city loop and puts them in a different, in a different tunnel. So, so they're different issues. I'm not, saying that the up, I'm not saying that the duplication should not occur, but the Melbourne Metro Tunnel will increase capacity by 71% and that's, that's, that's going to happen. Once we, re once we remove the level crossings um, on the upfield line, that will increase capacity even more than 71%. So, um, so that's my answer in, in relation to the second question. If I'm elected as the Labor MP, um, I will be inside uh, the most progressive government in our history. And it's one that's delivered treaty for Indigenous people. It has delivered the biggest transport infrastructure that's ever been seen in Victorian history. It's a government that's made enormous investments and it's also a government that's been the most ambitious um, on climate action, which is why we're about to, um, which was why we're smashing our climate targets and we're going to get to 50% emissions reduction by 2030. There's a lot to get done in Brunswick and at this moment in history when we have a Labor government in Victoria and a Labor government in Canberra, I think there's enormous potential and I'll be a local member who can deliver for my community. I'm active, I'm energetic and I know how to work in government to get things done. Thanks very much. It's been a great forum. Thanks for hosting it and thanks everyone for listening. I'll start quickly with those questions and I basically agree with Councillor Bolton's proposition that the upfield line should be duplicated from Gary to upfield sooner rather than later and why not when the, the, uh, the line is cut here because the track's there, the land's there, it's just a case of laying a bit more track. It would add a, just a fraction to the cost of the, the more than a billion dollars cost to do the level crossing removal here and therein lies the answer to the other question about the Bell Street Bridge, which ne clearly needs protection for pedestrians and, and kids on bikes getting to Coburg High. I think the answer is to talk to the Greens candidate for Pasco Vale, Angelica Panopoulos, because when you make a seat marginal, people pay attention to it. Brunswick was held by Labor for 100 years. 
make it marginal and things happen. We just got a one point something billion dollar level crossing removal project announced, which is fantastic. And look at all the good things that are going to come from that. Make Pasco Vale marginal and watch governments pay attention. We can't help it. We're self-interested. Make our seats marginal and we'll listen even more carefully. And so, just to remind you, in the lower house of the Victorian Parliament, there are 88 seats, 55 held by Labor, 27 by the Liberal Nationals, 3 by the Greens and 3 by Rural Independents. We need more Greens in the lower house of the Victorian Parliament and the upper house to push governments, particularly this Labor one, to go further and go faster in making our public transport system a real network, making services run more frequently, making connections better, so that that family with four cars can get rid of some of them. Thanks for listening. Well, it's been an action-packed session. Thank you so much for, for being here. I'd, I'd like to run through some quick thank yous, particularly to our host, the Marybeck City Council, under the leadership of Councillor Mark Riley, the Mayor, and his colleagues, uh, Councillor James Conlon, Councillor Sue Bolton, Councillor Monica Hart, and Councillor Angelica Panopoulos, who are here tonight. I'd like to acknowledge the concierges, respectively, Sue Sullivan and Craig Griffiths from the Council, for, for making it possible. <laughs> Thank you so much for generously hosting tonight. I'd, I'd like to acknowledge all of the, the candidates who are, who are here tonight who are vying for the seat of Brunswick and for the Northern Metropolitan Region. Uh, variously, Jerome Small, the Victorian Socialist candidate for Northern Metro, Rachel Lamarch, the Animal Justice Party candidate for Brunswick, and Lee Horsfall, the candidate for the Australian Justice, uh, Animal Justice Party for Northern Metro. Th thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for asking questions. Good luck in your campaigns. And I've, I've been Jonathan Marston, the chair of the Metropolitan Transport Forum. I'm proud to uh, be able to thank my colleague, Jane um, Waldock, who is the executive officer of the organisation, and of course, Mr Greg Day, who has organised all of the forums. Uh, there are some to come, and I hope that you can join us at, at one of the other exciting election forums in the weeks to come. But finally, let me thank you, the audience, for, for being here tonight, for all you do in your work, your advocacy, your agitation, your candidacy in, in participating in the vibrant democracy that is Brunswick and the Northern Metropolitan Region. Please thank our four panellists tonight. We had Mike, we had Tim, Evan and Shay. Thank them for spending time with us. I, I wish you and all the candidates all the best of luck in the upcoming state election. Thank you for being here and good night.